and to our very first Q&A. And I know that you're excited. He's standing out in the sun. We don't want to leave him out there too long. <laughs> arguably, arguably, and I'm not even going to argue. Arguably the best Lex Luthor ever filmed. Yeah! Let's make him welcome Mr. John Shea. stand up here with you. Thank you so much. I'm not good at sitting down. How about you? I know you're sitting down, but all right. Maybe I'll... <laughs> there. Okay, good. I can't sit down. That's <laughs> good. I'm too pumped up. I'm so happy to be here in Metropolis. I am, I really am, wow. All right, let me tell you where I came from, okay? So I work in Los Angeles and I commute from Los Angeles to Nantucket Island where I live. I live off the East Coast, off the coast of Cape Cod. So yesterday was my daughter's graduation from eighth grade. Yeah. I flew from LA to be there for her. And then uh, we had a little luncheon after the graduation. I went out to the airport. I flew from Nantucket to Boston, from Boston to Cincinnati, from Cincinnati to um, Nashville. And then I rented an Avis rent car in Nashville. And I drove last night about two and a half hours, about 90 miles an hour, to Metropolis. Yeah. I, I couldn't be happier. Doug, thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. And I think we, this should just be like a free for all, OK? And anything you ever wanted to know or ask about, you know, Lois and Clark or Lex Luthor or anything else that you ever cross your mind, then if I can answer it, I will. I'll just say this about how Lois and Clark came to be, in case you're interested, okay, and how I ended up playing Lex Luthor. So, uh, look, you know, in those days I was living in Los Angeles and I had uh, a wife and kid, I was, she was in kindergarten and I don't know, I had done one other series, and one day my manager called me up and he said, hey, John, would you be interested in reading a script? They're having difficulty, they're doing a reboot of the Superman franchise at Warner Brothers, and they're looking for somebody to play Lex Luthor. Would you read the script? And I said, yes, send it over. So I read the script, and honestly, like there's love at first sight, you know, or friendship at first sight, or you drive into a town and you say, I want to live there. I read that script and I knew Lex Luthor. As a kid, of course, I had grown up with Lex Luthor, like you had. I had grown up with him, you know, watching the comic books. I'd watched the original television show. I had you know, been a big fan of the Superman franchise. Uh, and, but, and I read this, the, the screenplay for the original Lois and Clark. I, I saw in my mind how Lex Luthor should be. It seemed to me that he should be a combination of like, you know, be like Cary Grant, you know, or in those days, Donald Trump. Like a, Billionaire playboy, you know, before Donald Trump became Donald Trump, you know, he's was, was still Donald, you know. Uh, but also that he should look like Cary Grant, you know, and wear cool suits and be really, you know, like a ladies' man. But at the same time, he should think like Richard the Third. He should be a total sociopath, right? Oh, so. I worked on this audition at my home, and I drove to Warner Brothers, which was about an hour from where I was living, down in the valley, up into Burbank, and I went into the office of the president of Warner Brothers. His name was, what's his name? Um, he's now the president of CBS. Uh, we can Google him and find out. It'll come to me in a second. Anyway, I went into his office, and um, they said, okay, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to do you know, this one speech that he gives, and then I want to do a couple of scenes like this. And all I can tell you is that I put on my best suit. I only had one suit, I didn't tell them that. But I had on my Armani suit, you know what I mean? And I had a really cool tie and a white shirt and my best shoes. And, and I just went for it. But the way, I, the way I thought of him is that he would be absolutely charming and natural. There should be nothing overtly villainous about him. This should be only a kind of person that you might trust with your money if you're uh, a real estate investor. <laughs> you want to, you know, like, right? Like Donald Trump, right? You know what I'm saying? You give him your money, you think that he's going to make you more money. 
So anyway, the point, uh, I, I did that audition for them and they said, okay. And then the next day they said, you gotta go over, to, you, you, you know, you're good for us, but you gotta go over and you have to do it at ABC. And I didn't know that. There was a catch in the ground. So the next day I had to go over to ABC. And at ABC they had a theater about this size. And in that they had about 20 people from the network, the president of ABC, Bob Iger, and all these other big wigs. And, and there was one other guy who was competing with me for Lex Luthor. And he was a friend of mine. His name is David Clennon. And we had done a movie called Missing together many years before with Jack Lemmon and Sissy Spacek and, uh, in uh, Mexico together, and I was like, hey man, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm up for Lex Luthor. And so the two of us had to go at it one-on-one, -on -one, you know? I went in and did the scene, and then David would go in and he would do the scene. And then I would wait outside and sweat it out a little bit, and then I would go in and do the scene, and then, you know, we went back and forth. And on my way back from ABC, my phone rang, and it was my manager telling me that I had the part. And I have to say, uh, I said, well, who's playing Superman. They said, well, we don't know yet. we got to cast that part. And I said, well, who's playing Lois Lane? And they said, Terry Hatcher. And I said, oh, man, I knew Terry. Terry was a friend of mine. We had the same manager in Los Angeles. We'd been hanging out a little bit together. And so I knew that I was going to be loving to work with her. And then uh, maybe a couple of days later, they cast Dean Cain, and the three of us showed up at Warner Brothers for the very first reading of the script. And then they had... Um, uh, you know, the other principal members of the cast come in. And we sat around the table and read the script. And I can tell you, from that very first moment, I knew that we were going to be a hit because the script was so well written. It was written by a woman, a woman named Deborah Joy Levine. And Deborah Joy Levine was a fantastic woman with this great girth and great bosoms and, you know. <laughs> Great double chin, and she just when she laughed, she just everything just kind of shook, and she laughed a lot. But she also, you know, was a huge Superman fan, and she knew how to write for men, and she knew how to write for women. And but what she brought to the Lois and Clark concept of Superman was a kind of Lois and Clark as a romantic triangle, and that Lex Luthor was going to be the other part of that triangle. It was a very different take on the whole thing, uh -huh. and so that's what launched us. We shot it on the, on the back stages at Warner Brothers. We shot it on sound stages there. They had one sound stage that was dedicated just to the Lex Luthor sets. They had another sound stage that was dedicated to uh, where Clark lived, his apartment, and Lois's apartment. And then they had another huge sound stage that was set up for the Daily Planet. It was just, you know, the big newspaper uh, that Perry White and all those guys ran. And it was, you know, it was really fantastic. And so we spent four years there. And uh, I came and went from it. I did the whole first season, but I was commuting from Manhattan every single week. So I would get on a plane in New York City, I'd go out to the JFK, I would fly to Los Angeles, to Bur I would drive out to Burbank, and I would shoot the Lex Luthor scenes for three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then on Wednesday night, I would get on a red eye, I would fly back to Metropolis, the other Metropolis, right? New York City, and then we would, I would be there with my wife and kid, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'd get out of the red eye again, go back to LA. I did that for three years. It was crazy. I had more frequent flyer miles than Superman, let me tell you. <laughs> and I swear I'm better than he is. And this is what I thought about Superman. They kept asking me, you know, okay, so if you had a superpower, what superpower would you have? And as I started meeting people around the country and really around the world doing Lois and Clark, I thought, the coolest superpower, Doug, to have would be the power of healing. To be able to have a kid come up to you in an autograph line like I just did, you know, and to be able to say to that kid, you know, what's, what's wrong? And to have that kid say, well, you know, I have autism. And to be able to put your hand, you know, like on his third eye, you know what I mean? And to heal that kid or a blind person, or somebody in a wheelchair, and to be able to have them, I thought, wouldn't that be the greatest, the greatest superpower of all? And I know that's what the saints and some of the great gurus have had over the years, that power to heal. And I think that also the thing that drew all of us to Superman was because he had the power to heal, right? He could heal strife, 
he could come into a situation and break it up. And let's face it, even though I love Lex Luthor, Lex Luthor is a sociopath. Lex Luthor is like a lot of presidents of the United States, and the heads of foreign countries, and the heads of major corporations that run this world. They are guys with no conscience. They are only after one thing, and that is to satisfy their appetites. And whatever that appetite might be, you just better get out of their way. Listen, I had done a film that I'd shot in France years before, and I knew I was the bad guy, and I knew I was gonna try to kill this woman in the course of the film, but what kind of a bad guy was I? You know, was I a psychopath? Was I, what was I? So I entered myself into psychoanalysis at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City in character. And I worked with the head of the abnormal psychology department. And, and that's where all the New York City police detectives go to study abnormal psychology. Like, because they get to deal with all the bad guys, all the, all the crazy people out there in New York City, right? So I said, all right, read the script and, and tell me what I am. And he said, John, in this, in this movie, you are a sociopath. And I said, okay, what is a sociopath? And he said, well, a sociopath is somebody who has no conscience. He has no little voice that says that's right or that's wrong. All he has are appetites that drive him unconsciously. And so, and so Lex Luthor, at the beginning of Lois and Clark, you know, I had long conversations with Deborah Joy Levine, the writer, about all of this. And I said, so when he's sitting there in his office and you know, he's bored out of his mind because he's rich, he's powerful, he's on top of the world, literally, and then Lex Corey is looking down on everything and everybody. He's an egomaniac, he's a narcissist, he's like, you know, everybody just does what he says. He's got no challenge in his life. And he's a competitive guy. And one day, this guy flies up and lands on his balcony and he looks at him and he thinks, okay, let the games begin. Because we can have some fun here. Who is this guy? Okay, he's got stuff that I never dreamed of having. And that's how the whole Superman mythology, that's why it's so great. For me also, I have read the work of Friedrich Nietzsche, a great you know, German philosopher who had talked about the Ubermensch. And it was Nietzsche who had inspired Hitler, the whole German, the Nazi thing, because they all thought of themselves as supermen. They called themselves Ubermensches, Overmen, Ubermensch. And then Superman, by Jerry Schuster and the writers, was taken from the work of Nietzsche and the early concepts of having this guy who was more powerful than everybody else. Now, the Germans thought they were. We taught them a lesson about who was really powerful. Am I right? That's what yeah. it is. We found out who the real supermen were. They were the Americans, and they were the English, and they were the guys who dug in and would not say no. Um, anyway, uh, what I've discovered is that supermen are men, you know, and women. It's, it's inside you. And what makes Superman, I think, so great in the end is, yes, he's inherited these powers, and I used to joke about the fact that Superman inherited all of his stuff, and Lex Luthor earned all of his stuff, and that's one of the things that they didn't have in common. But the truth is about what Superman, what Clark Kent has, is a great heart. He is a good person, and that goodness will always triumph over badness, evil, greed, unconscious desires to dominate and hurt people. And so that's why we're all here in a town called Metropolis, and that's why there's a statue of Superman up there instead of Lex Luthor, okay? <laughs> yeah. But I still feel that I have to embody Lex Luthor, and so I will. So let me open this to questions, Doug. What do you think? Anybody have any questions at all about anything? We have our own little Supergirl with a mic. If you have a question, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Shea has answered most of them. So you've been a lovely audience. God bless you. Good night, everybody. Uh, if you just raise your hand, Supergirl will come to you with a mic so that Mr. Shea can hear your question. Um, I remember Lex Luthor, I, Lois and Clark came on TV when I was nine years old, watched the whole thing, thank you so much. Um, my question for you, 
Thank you, brother. Is um, what were some of your favorite things to do as a legislator oh, on Boston Clark? And on top of that, what was the one thing you wish you could do? As, as a nine-year-old boy, I kind of wish that you had been able to get in the mech suit at one point, straight out of Action Comics, and be able to just kind of run the brain and scream and punch Dean King. <laughs> You know, uh, I'll tell you a couple things. My favorite thing to do for the whole four years was making out with Terry Hatcher. Yeah! Yeah! Okay? All right? I'm ready to put an old American man! Yeah! And Terry Hatcher, when she came on the set for Lois and Clark, was like, oh my God, I am going to fight that guy. I don't care what he's wearing. And if I can't beat him hand to hand, I'll because I'm smarter than he is, right? <laughs> so anyway, that was the most fun of it. But there's a couple of scenes where I got to make out with her, and oh my god, that was so much fun. Um, <laughs> she was so great to work with. I have to say, I love Terry Hatcher. I haven't seen her for years, but I love her. I, you know, I miss her. We just had so much fun. It was like perfect chemistry. And I have to say, I love Dean Kane. I know he was here last year. Oh my God, Dean Kane was such a good guy. You know, he was an athlete. We both played football. I had played for a small college in Maine called Bates, and he had played for a big college in New Jersey called Princeton. <laughs> but the first time I saw him, I got down to the three point stance, and I said, okay, baby, let's see what you got. <laughs> I was a lineman, you know what I'm saying? I was a linebacker and a defensive end. I like to hit people. <laughs> and, uh, but Dean was an athlete, you know, and that's one of the things he brought that grace with him to the whole thing. And so, um, anyway, just being with them, I have to say, was a, a real blessing. We never fought, never argued. All the times we were together, we had a great time together. But I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a, a Lex Luthor story to answer your question. You know, and, 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 and here's the thing, there's an episode, do you remember, where I am flying at the beginning of an episode and I have that Lex on my shirt? That for me was like the, the second greatest to Electric Terry, which was to fly like Superman did. They put me up on the uh, crane on these massive harnesses and, and they strap it between your legs and they bring it up and they have a wire that goes down through the middle of your back so you have to counter lever yourself like this and there's a wire going up through your back and it goes straight up into the ceiling about six seventy feet high and you're in i was in the lex luther costume and said no but it was the same thing as the superman costume and i had to fly around like this right Pretend like I'm flying, they had wind machines. And behind me, they had a massive green screen cyclorama. I'll do that again. Yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. I mean, can you imagine flying? I mean, like, really flying? I mean, not when you're high, but I mean, like, real high. So, anyway, that was a thrill for me because they brought me up. And they flew me around 50, 60 feet above the air in the big sound stage of Warner Brothers. And, and one of the, I'm not sure if he's here right now, some, some kid had a, or guy, you have it. The, they, they made playing cards, of Lex Luthor playing cards, and he's actually got the photograph. Uh, and, and I had only ever seen it once before when they first came out, they brought it on the set one day. Here, let's show it to our friends. Just, just here, pass it around. It, it's the coolest, <laughs> coolest moment of my life, okay? It's the coolest moment of my, of, of my acting life, you know? You know, just, you don't have to actually pass it around, just, you know, but it's, it's really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but look, here, here, this is what Lex Luthor did to me. You know how they say actors become their characters and the character screws you up or changes you in some way? Maybe it's sometimes a good way. But with Lex Luthor, my wife never knew who, you know, like was coming home. Right? <laughs> and that might have been fun for her, too, you know? Might have been like having an affair with a guy that looked vaguely familiar. But something about him had changed. So one day we're on the set at um, Lex Luthor's office, LexCorp, and I have this big desk, and 
And um, they have the balcony behind me that he's flown up on, right? You remember that set? I have a cigar in my hand and I have a telephone call and I'm calling the mayor of Metropolis, Sonny Bono. God loves Sonny Bono, right? Yeah! Sonny and Cher, right? So, so I'm on the other line, so Sonny Bono's on the other line, and he's standing off camera. He's reading the lines from me, and I'm saying to the mayor of Metropolis, well, listen, you better get that together, or you will no longer be the mayor. And I take the phone and I slam it down like this, bang, like this. And the camera, as I do that, is supposed to come on a dolly track, like where you are, you know, that far away, it comes closer and closer and closer, and it's supposed to end up on a big close-up of my face, like this, furious with Sonny Bono as I slam this thing down. But for whatever reason, the guys are having difficulty getting the focus right. So take after take, Doug, take after take. They're blowing it, take one, take three, take five, take seven. Now the producer's standing there, it's time for lunch. They're going into <coughs> overtime. It's gonna cost $100,000 if they have meal penalties. So they better get this right in the next take or else we're gonna do this after lunch and nobody wants to come back and do this after lunch because we're into it, right? So, we know, we got one more take. So, I light my cigar again. I got the whole thing going. Um, everybody ready, everybody set. And remember, there's like a hundred people on the set. A hundred makeup people, art people, the costume people, the set, the grips, the lighting people. There's two or three cameras going at the same time. But the main shot is this dolly shot that's gonna come toward me closer and closer and closer. And I say to Sonny Bono, listen, you better get it together or you are toast. I slammed on the phone. And the camera is coming closer and closer, and I don't hear a cut. But what happens is that when I slam down the phone, I have a cigar in my hand. The ash from the cigar goes up in the air, and it lands on the back of my hand. The burning ember, the very end of the cigar, lands on the back of my hand. And because my face is in the position that they told me to hold, I can now smell my own burning flesh. Rising from my hand, going through my nostrils, into my new medulla oblongata, which is telling me, ow! But instead of being able to say, ow, I have to hold that pose as the camera's coming in closer and closer and closer and finally comes in, and they hold it for, it seems like, an eternity, and they go, cut! And I go, yeah! And the director says, cut, print, perfect job, what a great expression on your face! Step over here, brother. Doug <laughs> is a lot bigger than I am, so I'm not going to screw around with him, okay? But Doug, what do you see there on the top of my head? Right yeah, brother. I see scar tissue. <laughs> yeah, baby! <laughs> Lex Luthor is with me until the day I die, okay? When they cremate me and they throw my ashes in the Atlantic Ocean, and they will. That little scar uh, is gonna go with them, uh, and so will uh, that memory of Lex Luthor, but that moment will always be there on your DVD and so. <laughs> A man who suffers for his crap, ladies and gentlemen. It's what any actor would do. Any football player, you know? I mean, actors are pussies compared to football players. <laughs> Baseball players, come on. Think about the guys who are bleeding with broken things and, you know, and all, yeah, I don't know, college baseball players, women lacrosse players, I, I don't care, athletes. Because um, everybody wants to win, right? All right, another question, anybody? Anyone? Yeah, right there, in the hat. Hello, hey, in the, uh, the scene where you're facing off the Cobra, Yeah. I, what were you staring at? The Cobra. <laughs> No, no, that was a real cobra, a real, oh. a real uh, cobra snake handler, you know, special effects guy was there. And by the way, these guys do not inspire confidence in you when they show up, okay? <laughs> they look like they've crawled out from under the same rock as the cobra. <laughs> they're all these guys with, uh, you know, like long hair and they haven't shaved for a couple of days and they're on something and they're always smoking outside when you look for them. And then they come on and they bring out a deathly poisonous snake. <laughs> And, you're, and they do not inspire confidence in you. And they tell me, you have nothing to worry about. <laughs> and I know I have everything to worry about, okay? And this snake 
And so, there's a, and by the way, they have the police, and they have the fire department, and they have all the doors shut, and they have just me on the set. The crew is, you know, like standing on, you know, like, like woo, you know? Microphones, and then the only person who could actually die is me. And I'm lying there in front of the fireplace like, uh, you know, I don't have a care in the world. I got a brand and a cigar, and I turn around, and so let me just say, once again, it's not acting. <laughs> There comes this slithery death machine closer and closer, and then he rises up, and I just, the guy just told me, don't move. Just stare him down. And so, uh, being a good actor, I did that. I just looked at that snake in the eye, and I thought, I thought I was evil? <laughs> that snake is evil. That snake is a sociopath, because he only wants to do one thing. Kill me. Is that where the tears came from as well? You know, uh, I, I, I was staring so hard at the snake because you notice know, about snakes, they don't blink. And so, the only way I could stare them down was to keep my eyes open. I knew if I blinked, I was dead. So I started to cry. <laughs> anyway, it's what we do. Um, my I, question. I, 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 sorry, Doug, yeah. Uh, an awful lot of villains don't believe they're villains. They actually believe they're the hero. If you would just do things my way, the world would be a much better place. Is that how you approach Lex in, in some instances? Well, absolutely, Doug. Thank you for asking. Look, the world would be a lot better, better place if Lex Luthor actually ran it. In fact, it was a really good place until Superman showed up. <laughs> okay? We had an order to things, sort of the way things when Saddam Hussein was in open power, you know? Yes, Saddam Hussein was a sociopath, and yes, he killed people, but, you know, there was no gang warfare. Uh, and there might have been some other good things, you know, that you could say about that reign. It got worse after he left, for sure. We saw the real, you know, it was like a scab was pulled off. And the same thing happened in Metropolis, you know? So look, the thing about um, sociopaths and Lex Luthor and guys like that is that, yes, of course they only, they believe they're right. And they, because they have no conscience that we talked about, you cannot tell them that they're wrong because they don't even know what wrong means. Does something work or doesn't it work? And Metropolis for Lex was working. And it stopped working when, you know, that Big Blue. Well, yeah, Big Blue showed up to kind of screw up his plan. He had a master plan. Um, okay, yes, sir. <clears throat> Hi, John. My name is Pete. Thank you for what you did with Lex. One of my favorite straight, look, real performances of Lex. I, I love what you did with the character. Uh, two things. One, when you, uh, the scene where you dove off to your death and you did Top of the World, it looks like you almost ate it when you hit that. The, it was that just acting or you were almost really losing your balance. How many takes did you take? Because the one they used, it looks like I said, he's a couple of seconds away from actually going over the side. Thanks for asking. Look, I'll, I'll just say a couple things about that. One, Jimmy Cagney was one of my heroes as a kid growing up. Does anybody remember yeah. Jimmy Cagney? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, as a young actor, you know, I went to Yale Drama School where I studied acting and I went to the film school there to study filmmaking and at the end of the film school they showed, they had a film festival with Jimmy Cagney films and they showed all of his films and the last film was White Heat where he stands on top of an oil refinery and he's shooting down as the cops are surrounding him and he shoots down into the oil refinery and he goes, top of the world, man, top of the world. And bang, 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 he shoots into the, and the oil refinery blows up in a cloud of absolute devastation and Jimmy Cagney is no more. So years, the next year, I was living on Nantucket and he was staying at the hotel where I was a waiter. And I stopped him after breakfast and I said, Mr. Cagney, I just want to meet you. I'm sorry to say that, but I have one question. He goes, I'll see if I can do it. He goes, uh, God, I will, man. Yeah, sure, kid, what is it, what is it? <laughs> and, and by this time, he's got a beautiful little pot belly and he's got a cardigan sweater on with three buttons, you know. What is it, kid, what is it? I said, well, that scene of the white heat, you know, at the end, top of the world, not top of the world. How did you do that? And he said, kid, <clears throat> there's a funny thing. I'm only afraid of one thing, and that's heights, see? And so I had him build a, uh, a platform like 10 feet off the ground, see? Uh, we're Warner Brothers, see? And, uh, and uh, so I stood on the top of this little platform and put the cameras down below, they shoot up at me, and I went, top of the world, on top of the world, bang. 
And then they built a model of the oil refinery and they blew that up. He said, kid, forget it. All you gotta know is it's magic. It's magic, right? So 15, 20 years later, I'm shooting at Warner Brothers in, in the same sound stage where they shot White Heat. And I said to Jennifer and Joy Levine, we gotta put Top of the World, on Top of the World in here for Jimmy Cagney. And she said, yes, of course. But I knew that Jimmy Cagney was a great tap dancer. And one of the great things about him was that he had this unbelievable sense of balance, right? So I knew that if I got on the end, what Jimmy Cagney would have done is that he would have danced around and made it look like he was going to fall and look to his death and really like, whoa, right? whoa, right? And so I did that in honor of Jimmy Cagney. Excellent. choice to throw it away a line, throw, throw the line away, because I love the fact that you didn't blow it over the top, it just it was at the top of the world. And then you were gone. I love that, that read. Because, you know, I have a feeling that Jimmy Cagney would have been one of Lex Luthor's heroes, but it might not have been a line that he would have thought to say as he was jumping to his death. It might have been a line that occurred to him on the way down, you know, I don't know. The other thing is that, uh, no, we had really good stun people, and I was probably 20 feet off the ground, but still, they had pads down there and all that stuff. And, uh, and I have to say, I love doing stunts, and that was one of the great things about Lois and Clark, is that Dean did all of his own stunts, I did my stunts, it was really fun. Uh, the one last question, because you're very present as Lex, during this, the balcony scene in the premiere, you would, you know, let the games begin, clearly you would have had the upper hand, and then, he tops you if you want to find it, just look up. I'm sure you've given thought to it. Just how pissed off did that make Lex, yes. that final line? Which, which, which final line? When he says, you know, let the games begin, and then Superman flies up and goes, I'll be around by, if you need to find me, just look up. Oh, just look up. And I'm up. thinking, yeah. how well, much would that have cheesed well, him off? Well, well, you know, that's the, again, that was the Deborah Joy of the Vine line, because what she's doing in that moment is setting up the rivalry that's going to last for the next four years, right? And I have to say, it's just perfect, because he's not a guy who's willing to look up at anybody. Just now, I was standing under that statue, and all I could see was his crotch. <laughs> It was not my favorite moment, okay? But that's a little bit how I felt in that moment, you know? I felt like I was about this big, you know? Okay, yes, right there.